So welcome to 2022. And as we start this year, as Sai said, we're beginning a new sermon series entitled Living Well Together. Here at St. Michael's, we are committed to learning and growing together. It is part of our vision statement. To do this well, we strive to strengthen the quality of our relationships. Living Well Together focuses on six pastoral principles over the next five weeks to help us do just that. The principles will help us identify the barriers to fruitful growth. Personal growth, yes, but our particular focus in this series will be on growth in our relationships with one another. The barriers that stop that growth are power, ignorance, fear, prejudice, silence, and hypocrisy. These pastoral principles were designed to help the Church of England, which we are part of, address these barriers and navigate our way through discussions on human sexuality. They build trust, they model generosity, and they are a good reminder that the body of Christ, even when there are differences of opinion, is called to live well together. So we're starting this morning by looking at ignorance and power, more specifically how we address ignorance and how we pay attention to power dynamics. So a light topic to kick off 2022 with. But actually this is a great way to start the year because looking at these issues, these barriers and addressing them means our relationships with each other will be better, more honest and open and stronger as a result. And that can only be a good thing. Not necessarily easy, but a good thing as we move forward together. And as we look at ignorance and power in the context of relationships this morning, we'll see that listening, real listening, is one of the things that addresses both of them. And we'll see what this brilliant passage from Philippians has to say on the subject, which is quite a lot as it happens. So let's start with ignorance. Now, there are all sorts of things that ignorance can mean, but remember that we're thinking about ignorance in the context of relationships. So this is about people. It's not about knowledge. It's about one another's stories, one another's experience, our different backgrounds and understanding, our choices, why those choices were made or maybe not made, and all our stories and our experiences will be different. Differences are not wrong. Take a look around you or look at the comments online from different people. Now, there are people who are tech savvy and can write comments in the chat and those who can't. And there are people who are taller than you and people who are shorter than you, who are older or younger than you, who have more or less hair than you do, who are wearing different style clothes from the ones you would choose. Some who prefer tea to coffee and some who drink neither. Some who are vegan, vegetarian or carnivore. Some who are single, some who are married. Some who have different skin colours from your own. Some who have been up for hours already. And some who have just rolled out of bed and made it to church. And that's just here at St Michael's. The wider church is full of people who speak different languages from different cultures, experiences, traditions, expectations, understanding, new churches and well-established churches. The list goes on. These differences are not wrong. And nor are the differences in our stories and our experiences. They are what make us who we are. And we are all loved children of God and we are all made in his image. The issue comes when we label each other because of our differences. Oh, well, you're a woman, you're bound, bound to react like that. What, you men, you think you can just, what, single parents should, well, you would behave like that because you are young. Or you would say that because you're, insert label here. Now these generalizations, these labels are unhelpful. They can lead to assumption and misunderstanding and ultimately to judgment, whether subconsciously or not. The barriers go up between us. We become us and them instead of just us, and we end up asking, whose side are you on? Rob and I watched The Unforgivable on Netflix this weekend, and uh, without any spoilers, there was a whole load of labelling and assumption going on. 
Once the main character's story was heard, really heard, there was a seismic shift in reaction to her and in her relationships. But it was hard to hear her story and therefore to understand her and her choices because of assumptions made about her because of the labels she had been given. Now, I recommend that you watch it if you haven't already, as long as you are over 15. <laughs> but we are not here to win a debate or an argument. We are here to listen to one another and to be kind in the process, to take care of one another as we learn to live well together. Jesus never said, blessed are those who are right. In fact, our reading from Philippians says the opposite. This is verses three and four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Let's just keep that on the screen a minute, because I think these verses are such good ones as we begin this sermon series. Just have a read of that again. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We can value others above ourselves best when we know their stories. When we know what makes them tick, why they've made the choices they've made, and why they react the way they do. And that means listening to them, to each other. And by that, I mean real listening, not assuming anything because of the clothes they wear, their age, gender, skin colour, or even their role within the church. Let's not make assumptions or be ignorant of one another's stories. Let's not listen as a tick box exercise before we launch into our own opinions. Let's not listen just to take on information, although that may be part of it. Let's listen in order to understand each other, and to live well together. When we live well together, we don't take sides. The Slovenian philosopher Zizek said that an enemy is someone whose story you have not heard. Let's hear one another's stories and let's live well together. The better we love and understand and respect one another and our different views, including each other's understanding of scripture, the better placed we are to talk about, to understand, and to appreciate difference. We have no excuse not to listen to one another as we begin our discussions on human sexuality. And as we listen, let's remember that we are all imperfect. We are all forgiven sinners. We are all here only because of God's love and grace. That's all we've got. 2 Corinthians 12, 19 says this. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Our God's grace is all that we need. But that leads us, to think, uh, leads us on to think about power. Our power dynamics can come into play in any relationship, and we often don't notice them. And by power dynamics, I mean how we relate to one another because of our different roles, genders, ages, ethnicity, education, all those labels that we're trying to avoid. But we are human and power dynamics come into play in any relationship because of these things, whether we realise it or not. And we need to acknowledge and pay attention to these so that they don't get in the way of our relationships. I don't know how many of you have read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis or seen the film, probably quite a lot of us. But when Lucy has discovered the magical land of Narnia, she tells her brothers and her sister about it. They don't believe her because she is the youngest and she is a girl. They ridicule her. Yes, it is an improbable story, but it is true. And her siblings don't believe her. But Lucy's age and her gender meant that she and her story were just dismissed. Now, that may seem like a trivial example, but power dynamics are at play here, just as they are today between different age groups whose opinions get dismissed at either end of the age spectrum, and between men and women, for example, in the campaign for safer streets. 
Power dynamics are particularly noticeable when the decisions of others have an impact on our lives. Some people have powerful or loud personalities that make it difficult for us to challenge them. Some people are far more articulate than we are, unable to express themselves much more clearly than we can. But none of this means that our stories or our experiences are wrong. It just makes them harder to share because we might feel inadequate or in some way less. And some of our stories are deeply personal. And again, that makes them hard to share, which in turn can make it hard to be understood. All our stories and experiences are valid, whether we are able to share them or whether we find it difficult to share them. All our stories are valid and we are valid. How do we begin to address some of these power dynamics? Well, first of all, I think we need to be aware. Only then can we begin to address any power imbalance. If we're not aware, then an abuse of that power can easily take place, maybe without us realising it. And any abuse of power, especially over those who are marginalised or vulnerable, can be devastating for all involved. But the reverse is also true. We need to be aware of our own vulnerability. We need to be aware of how we relate to the person that we're speaking to or listening to. How does that relationship affect what we're hearing and how we hear it? And this is particularly important in any discussion about difference. And the other thing that we have to remember is that it's God and only God who works in our lives. Look at the first bit of verse 9 from our reading. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. God does the exalting, not us. Our job is to be humble and to consider others better than ourselves, as we read in verses 3 and 4. God does the exalting. God does the work in our lives. Not the person praying for us or pastoring us. Only God Prayers and pastors are brilliant, and yes, please, let's keep doing that for one another. But let's recognize that it's God that does the work, and prayers and pastors are simply standing alongside us and helping enable that. Remember that it's God doing the work and not us, as we learn to live well together. And one final thing we need to do is the same thing that we needed to do as we address ignorance, and that is listen to one another. Yes, let's be aware of the different agendas and power dynamics as we listen to one another, but let's listen to our individual, unlabeled stories. Let's listen to Sai's story, not the vicar's story. Let's listen to George's story, not the student's story. Let's listen to Tamara's story, not the worship leader's story. Listening, really listening, takes away the labels, breaks down the barriers that are put up by labels and power dynamics. And as we know from our own experience and from the testimony from those Kintsugi Hope video, it gives value to the person being listened to. So let's be aware of that. Let's let God do the work and let's listen to one another. And what about Jesus? What does our reading say? How does who Jesus is fit into all this? Well, this is an amazing reading from Philippians. It completely addresses these issues of ignorance and power. Have you heard the phrase that to really get to know someone, you need to walk a mile in their shoes? Jesus did that. In fact, he did so much more than that. He didn't just walk a mile in our shoes. He became one of us. Look at verses 6 to 8 of our reading from Philippians 2. Who, being in the very nature of God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage? Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He became a human, so Jesus knows what it is like to be human. He knows what it is like to be loved and he knows what it is like to be rejected. 
He knows what it's like to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like not to be listened to and to be betrayed by his friends. He knows what it's like to experience unfairness and a miscarriage of justice. He knows what it's like for a family to be the subject of gossip and to have to flee for your own safety. He is not ignorant of anything that we experience. He's not ignorant of our humanity. He knows our story. And Jesus was God. At the time this letter was written, the emperors were proclaiming themselves gods because of their great strength and power, because that's what being a god meant. But Jesus was God, with more power than we can possibly know or imagine, certainly more than the emperors had. What did he do with that power? Jesus made himself nothing as it says in verse 7. He chose to humble himself rather than exploiting his divine power. He didn't call down lightning bolts on people. He didn't fight for his rights or demand attention or special treatment. He gave up all his power, everything, all of it. He is a God who is known for abandoning his rights for the sake of other people. He put people, that is us, First, because he loves us that much. He loves us enough to get to know us and not to hold on to his power. Instead, he died a shameful, painful and unfair death. That is what power looks like for Jesus. This is what it looks like to put others first, to understand who they are and not to lord power over them. Giving things away, not grasping them for yourself. As usual, the artist Charlie Mackesy manages to capture this in one picture. He uses the word strength instead of power, but the point is the same. What is the true sign of strength? Gentleness, says the horse. Real power lies in gentleness. And in fact, the horse's words are ones that Jesus uses of himself when he says in Matthew 11, For I am gentle and humble in heart. So Jesus is not ignorant of us. He doesn't use his divine power to his own advantage. And once we've begun to grasp this, the exhortations of verses 1 to 4 from our reading make a whole load more sense. Let's have a look at those again. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is what Jesus did. And this is what we're called to do as we learn to live well together. It's not easy, but it's not impossible when we remember that it's God that does the work and not us. He does it as we listen, really listen to one another so that we're not ignorant of each other's stories and experiences and understanding. He does it as we address these power dynamics, remembering that we are all loved and made in God's image. And as we try to put into practice Jesus' example of giving up everything, everything for the sake of others. And he does it through the other principles that we are going to be looking at in the weeks ahead. (laughs) 